Thanks for being here tonight to learn a little bit more about um, Marion Soil and Water Conservation District um, native plant programs. I see a lot of familiar names and faces on here, so that's great. Um, hi, everybody. So yeah, first we're gonna jump in just a little bit of background on the Marion Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we are a special district, so we're not a county agency, we're not state, we're not federal. Um, we're a local government agency and a special district, kind of like a fire district, if you will. Um, and we function essentially within the boundaries of Marion County. Um, our mission is to protect, conserve, and improve the quality of soil and water in Marion County through planning, technical assistance, and education. So we do that in several different ways. Um, we're not regulatory. Um, everybody that works with us, we essentially call it voluntary conservation. So people come to us when they have a concern or a problem or a question. Um, we offer free technical advice um, to help landowners with their natural resource um, kind of issues and needs um, related to soil and water conservation. Um, we do do outreach and try to get landowners to come and work with us, um, but it's definitely you know not on a regulatory basis for anything that they've necessarily done wrong. Um, and we do have a tax base. So our funding comes from a small portion of your property taxes from Marion County residents. Um, it's a very small portion. I live down in Corvallis in Benton County, and I think I pay for my urban lot, I pay $10 a year to the Soil and Water Conservation District down here. So um, it's a small amount, but we have a pretty big population in Marion County. So that allows us to have great programs and have um, other great staff besides myself um, here to help you. Um, and just kind of to show you some of the background on what we work on, we do have a strategic plan that has seven different goals that you can see here. Um, one of those main goals is native and invasive plant management. And um, part of one of the objectives of that goal is to promote the use and benefits of native plants. So that kind of forms the basis of our native plant program and for um, part of the work that I do as my job. Um, the converse of that is the invasive plant program as well, which I also work on. Um, so a lot of you affiliated with the Native Plant Society, I'm sure know all the benefits of native plants, but um, just to kind of go over this, and I love this graphic from um, Solve, from Oregon Solve. They have this great graphic on their website that I love to use um, in a lot of my presentations, but essentially, you know, those native plants along waterways are going to give us clean, cool water. They're going to help filter runoff. Um, they're going to provide shade that then cools the water and cools the streams which is important for our salmon and trout and other aquatic wildlife, our aquatic organisms. Um, it's important for wildlife and pollinator, I had to add that in there, pollinator habitat um, for our native critters. And it also helps with erosion control. I mean, those, those native plants along those streams are gonna help stabilize that soil and hold it in place and prevent it from washing downstream or eroding away from whatever reason. Um, and they're resilient. You know, they're adapted to our climate and our soils um, and the native pests are generally adapted to our native pests and diseases. Um, you know, there's lots of issues with non-native pests and diseases. So, but we're not really gonna get into that tonight, but um, and when you kind of think about adapted to our climate, um, you know, you think about the Pacific Northwest and we have a really unique climate here just with that it's so wet in the wintertime and so hot and dry in the summertime. Um, so plants really need to be kind of have special adaptations to be able to kind of survive those two um, different extremes. And just a little bit more on some of those benefits. Um, our native plants really do kind of require less care and maintenance um, because they've evolved without that use of supplemental water or fertilizer or pesticides. Um, you know, once plants are established, we don't really uh, recommend a lot of inputs after they're established. We do kind of recommend for, you know, the first couple of years to provide some supplemental water, you know, through establishment. So they kind of get those 
roots um, establish and be able to survive. Um, but after that, you know, if, if you don't have an irrigation system, uh, they don't need a lot of water just because they're, they're used to our climate. Um, and we can't forget that they are also very beautiful. So I think that's a, a great benefit, um, you know, to some people. Um, I love this quote from Doug Talame, uh, the author of Bringing Nature Home. He's had um, a couple other books um, come out since the Bringing Nature Home, but um, having a wildlife background, um, this book was really great for me to read and kind of pull out this quote. Um, and just by favoring native plants over aliens or invasive or even horticulture plants um, kind of in the in the landscape, um, we can do a lot to sustain the biodiversity that's been one of our country's richest assets. Um, native plants support and produce more insects and therefore more numbers and species of other animals. So, you know, essentially it starts with those native plants and then you're gonna attract those insects, which then are gonna attract birds and other species. Um, so it kind of just goes, goes up the food chain kind of from there. So, and just a couple kind of quick fun facts to throw out sort of from that book um, is that 96% of bird species raise their young on insects. So just trying to reiterate, you know, that importance of those insects and be able, being able to support those insect populations. And um, they talk about uh, chickadees in that book and a clutch of chickadees, um, the nestlings need about 5,000 insects just over about a two week period or a little longer while they're in the nest. Um, so if you think about that, that's almost 300 insects a day for that clutch of chickadees. So think about those parents flying back and forth and how many trips they have to take back and forth to whatever plant or wherever they're going um, to get those insects for, for those um, young to be able to survive. It's pretty amazing when you kind of break down the numbers like that and think about it. If anybody's ever had a chickadee nest that they've watched, those parents are constantly all day long going back and forth. So um, if we can help them out and put lots of native plants and they can make a nest near our native plants, we can, we can help them uh, conserve a little bit of energy. Um, kind of moving on to some of the things in our native plant program, the native plant sale and scholarship fundraiser is probably the most popular and well-known part of our native plant program. Um, if we were here in person instead of on the computer, I'd ask everybody to raise their hand and who, how many people have um, been to or participated in our native plant sale. And, um, you know, from a lot of the familiar faces I've seen, we have quite a few folks um, who support our plant sale. So thank you um, in many ways. Um, but our plant sale started in 2003. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ashling, for raising your hand there. Um, and uh, I've been coordinating the plant sale since 2009. Um, it is a scholarship fundraiser. We raise um, $4,000 every year to give away scholarships for two students in Marion County or from Marion County who are studying natural resources at an Oregon college or university. Um, when I first started with the plant sale, I think we were only raising $2,000. And so we've been able to double that amount in the, in the time that I've been coordinating the native, native plant sale. So that's um, exciting being able to give away more scholarship dollars. Um, you know, for our plant sale, we kind of promote sort of the right plant, right place mentality by providing a lot of information on all of the plants, kind of the light conditions, the soil conditions, the moisture conditions that they need and providing descriptions. So we really want you to, you know, be able to put these plants in, in the right place um, so they can survive and thrive and become, you know, functioning plants for um, part of the ecosystem. And for this year's, this upcoming year's sale, um, we are gonna do online ordering again. Um, that'll be up and available starting on January 5th. So we're working on um, getting that website up and together and getting everything going for you. Um, and we're probably, we're gonna essentially do kind of the same thing we did last year. We'll probably schedule um, pickups again. And we may, depending on, what's happening 
Um, with COVID, we may um, end up doing some in-person sales, but it just kind of depends on, on where we're at. We're hopeful that maybe we'll be able to do some in-person sales with, with things that we have left if we have leftovers. Um, we didn't have very many leftovers last year, um, but we will need volunteers to help fill orders this year. So if anybody is interested, this is my call for volunteers, um, my early call for volunteers. If anybody's interested in, in volunteering and help putting together those plant sale orders, um, you can get in touch with me at any time um, and we can start a sign up for that. Um, also part of our program is doing education and outreach. So giving talks like this, um, doing different presentations, um, different workshops. We do have a um, landowner workshop coming up in February for kind of small and small and large landowners um, called uh, Create a Plan for Your Land. It's a conservation planning series. Um, I think we're good, creating signups that'll be online pretty soon if you're interested in creating a whole conservation plan for your property. Um, that's what that class is going to be about. We have a great um, native plant page on our website. Um, with that, we have some information cards for over 40 different plants that kind of shows pictures and describes, um, describes them kind of where they grow, what the growing conditions are and what they look like. Um, we have a great um, bloom timetable for many native plants. Um, it shows the, the time of year that they bloom and the color that they bloom. And part of the idea with that is showing the time frame that they bloom. So you can try to have things growing and blooming throughout the year as much as you can for different pollinator species. I've also created a low water use um, native plant list that's really helpful for conserving water. Um, and then on our webpage, we also have, we did a workshop in February this past year of planning and planting your native garden. I don't know if anybody here participated in that workshop. That was a partnership with Polk and Yamhill Soil and Water Conservation Districts and the Lucky and Mute Watershed Council. So that's got some great um, native plant and planting information in it. So that whole video of that workshop is, it's about an hour or hour and a half, I think. It's it's on our website if you want to find some more native plant stuff to do on a rainy, cold night here this winter. Um, and then we do um, Salem Saturday Market. We incorporate some native plants into our Salem Saturday Market um, booth that we do throughout the summer. I think we do May, May, June, and July. We do three or four months at the Salem Market. And then um, our Facebook page on Thursdays. Thursdays are dedicated native plant posts on our Facebook page. So if anybody follows our Facebook, you'll see a native plant post on Thursdays. Mondays are invasive plant days. So we usually have something on invasives those days. Um, and then we have our first Friday presentations. I don't know if anybody has participated in those. This is the third year, I believe, of doing those. And that takes place the First Friday of every month, we kind of do that in fall through spring, so October through April. Um, I did kind of just throw up the, the schedule coming up for the next few months. Um, the January and February um, talks, I believe, will be um, involving native plants. The February 4th, for sure, is native winter twig ID. Um, I'm not sure how much the January 7th one will incorporate native plants, um, but I assume there'll probably be a little bit of that in there. And this is all on our website and those links will be provided to you. So don't have to frantically write these down um, right now. You can look up that information later. Um, we do incorporate native plants into a lot of our youth programs as well. Um, we have a series of program bins that can be checked out by teachers or by um, parents. Anybody can check those out. Uh, we have one program on pollinators. Um, you can see up here in this uh, picture in the upper left-hand corner there, that is somebody participating in the plant program. I think that's Cassie. I, saw, I thought I saw Cassie on the, um, as a participant here. So she's teaching about pollinators. And then in the middle there, I believe this group that she was teaching to went and planted native plants as part of a community service kind of after their pollinator talk. So kind of connecting the dots there a little bit. 
Um, and then the picture on the right is from our salmon watch program that we do every fall. Uh, we go out to Pack Saddle Park and take uh, several students and school field trips out there, um, usually in the month of September. And we teach about salmon watch and salmon biology. And I teach, um, I teach a lot of the riparian ecology station. So we wrap native plants into that and talk about the benefits of native plants and do a plant walk and identify um, native plants around the park. Um, and we also do native plant walks and things like that for other school field trips um, as, they, as they come up. Uh, we also do technical assistance as part of our program. So we can come out and visit your property if you have any questions um, or resource concerns or natural resource issues on your property, we can come out and take a look at your property. Um, and if you're interested in doing something like wildlife habitat or getting rid of invasive plants and then planting natives, um, we can help with that. Um, when we visit your property, we can give you native plant recommendations and information um, you know, for plants that would work on your property in different areas and help select the right plants for the right place. Um, we can help with plant identification. So I can come out to your property and look at something. Um, I have people call me on the phone and try to explain plants to me on the phone, which does not work when they start with it's green and it has leaves. Um, you know, that's a little difficult, but um, text me pictures, email me pictures. Um, I love playing that game. It's a fun challenge. So that's always a fun thing to, to do if you are stuck and have something growing in your yard and don't know what it is. Um, and then, you know, kind of through those site visits and um, we could just provide resources and references and information too. So if anybody, you know, calls up and has questions about certain plants or even invasive plants too, um, we can help you with resources for how to deal with invasive plants and how to, you know, attract wildlife or how to use those native plants. And kind of part of that technical assistance um, kind of turns into um, our landowner assistance program, which is a grant program that we have that helps landowners um, implement projects on their property. Um, mainly um, restoration um, type projects would be ones that involve native plants. So our restoration projects, you know, typically require native plants um, and they can be for urban and rural properties. Um, our program is kind of geared more towards the rural properties, but um, we have done um, urban restoration projects or adding, you know, native um, wildlife or pollinator habitat or doing some, um, you know, streamside, urban streamside habitat or um, invasive removal. Like if you have a bunch of ivy or something like that in an urban property, we could help with that. Um, and kind of some of the main project examples would be those native um, habitat restoration projects in streamside or riparian areas, oak or prairie habitats, uh, forest or woodland habitats, and wetlands. Um, a lot of our restoration projects do kind of start with that invasive plant removal piece and then adding the native plants after we've um, worked on the control of the invasives and got a hold of that. Um, we do work quite a bit with pollinator hedgerows on farms to kind of increase the diversity of pollinators on farms in places, some places where there might not be a lot of native plants or it's been kind of cleared for various reasons. Um, and this grant program is not only just for native habitat restoration. Um, we do lots of other projects related to agriculture and kind of small farms like cover crops, um, stormwater runoff, we could help with pasture and livestock management, um, erosion control, um, kind of irrigation efficiency are some of the other things that we work with with other landowners. So this assistance program kind of covers the whole wide range of natural resource issues and concerns. It's not just, you know, kind of dedicated to restoration. It's just one part of the program. Um, you know, I'm talking about, you know, promoting the use of native plants, you know, we also need to recognize that there can be some barriers to purchasing or finding native plants in the Salem area, um, particularly because they're not necessarily widely sold in retail stores. 
Um, there are quite a few wholesale sellers of native plants, you know, in Marion County and the local area. Um, but to just be able to kind of walk into a local garden shop, um, there's not a lot of places where you can go and find a wide selection of um, native plants, you know, and the the benefit of the wholesale places is that the plants are less expensive, um, but you can't go there and like go shopping and pick out your plants, right? Which kind of a lot of people want to do. And especially if you just want a couple plants, um, you can't really do that with the wholesale markets. So it can be kind of prohibitive with the wholesale um with that wholesale market. And then in Marion County, I, there's only one like strictly native wholesale nursery that I know of. A lot of other wholesale nurseries carry native plants as part of that, but it's not really the main part of their business. They just have some native plants that they kind of work with. Um, and then the wholesale nurseries are kind of geared towards producing plants for that restoration work. So they're not always... Um, kind of what I would term like retail quality. Um, they might not look as, as pretty as, um, you know, something that you would maybe want to find in a retail store or they're smaller or, you know, you get bare root plants from wholesale nurseries too. So, um, you know, finding plants that can go kind of from that wholesale market into retail can also be a barrier potentially. And then, there's also not a lot of landscape designers and landscape companies that work with native plants. So that can also be a barrier. And I've actually heard a landscape designer that told me specifically that they think native plants are ugly. So that was super hurtful. <laughs> and I am scarred for life, I think, by that comment. So um, anyway, you know, just outreaching even to them. So, you know, kind of what can we do um, to sort of to help that piece, right? So um, ask, ask your local nursery to carry native plants. If you're going in there someday, you know, ask if they could buy, you know, carry native plants. And if they get some, then please buy them, um, help them and support them um, to encourage them to buy more. Um, tell your friends to go buy native plants from this nursery, you know, like we need to support that, um, that economy as well. Um, encourage landscapers, if you're working with a landscaper on your property, encourage them to use native plants in their designs. Um, just doing more general outreach to the public about the benefits of native plants. I know that's part of my job, but um, if we all do that and work on that, I know master gardeners work on that a lot too, um, but we just need to, to keep doing it. Um, and then another idea I had, which um, I'm gonna to try to do, I just thought of this kind of as I was working on this program, but maybe do some outreach to local horticulture programs. Um, there are future kind of horticulture workers. So work with them to try to um, elevate the, the knowledge of native plants in that industry. Um, so this is kind of the, you know, the main crux of the program that I work in, but I wanted to also touch a little bit on something that I've been spending a lot of time on uh, the past uh, year and a half, a little over a year, is the wildfire recovery and response. So definitely a great um, chance and a way to promote the use of native plants in that recovery and restoration. Um, you know, devastating fires. I don't know how many people have been up that way. Um, I cried a lot the first few times I drove up there. Um, but, you know, I've been encouraged. We'll kind of go through a little bit, some pictures in here too, but um, it's recovering, it's recovering and it's recovering pretty well in a lot of places. So I'm super encouraged to see a lot of native plants coming back. Um, but almost immediately, once the fires happened, I was in immediate contact with the North San Diego Watershed Council, and we were out doing site visits and visiting people's property um, and helping them with recovery and restoration, providing information um, on native plants. I mean, we kind of started with that erosion control piece. Um, we got straw out there to try to prevent um, erosion from happening and to prevent that runoff from getting into the river. Um, we've worked to provide native plants and seeds um, for landowners and done some erosion risk assessments um, between the Soil and Water Conservation District and the 
Watershed Council, we've contacted, been in contact with over 200 landowners that have been impacted by the fires. Um, right after the fire, I was contacted and asked to participate in the erosion threat assessment reduction team to write the report piece on invasive plants. So um, I have a next slide about that where I can talk about that a little bit more. And something else that we've really been working on is doing some invasive plant surveys for that um, early detection um, so we can have kind of a rapid response to the things that are coming up, the invasive plants that are coming up or might be coming in off of equipment and disturbance and, and things like that. So it's been pretty overwhelming. Um, but a really positive experience overall and just seeing people all come together um, and work together. And a lot of people, you know, right away, they lost everything, but they were so concerned about the resource and erosion and what are they going to do with the plants? You know, they lost their home and they lost everything, but they're so concerned about the natural resources. So, um, you know, really touching and got to hear so many different stories um, from everybody. And we're working constantly on grant funding um, and trying to find money and resources to get native plants in the ground, control the invasive plants, stop erosion. Um, so yeah, there's lots of work happening. Um, so this erosion threat assessment reduction team report is called the ETART report. Um, if you aren't super intimate into the whole fire recovery thing, you probably have not heard of this, um, but it's being used a lot for a lot of these funding proposals that we're working on, um, and it's guiding um, kind of some of the restoration and things that we do um, as far as fire recovery. But essentially, um, what the invasive section was, was talking about protecting native plant communities from invasive plants. So we worked with a lot of different um, properties um, and essentially, you know, worked with soil burn severity, vegetation mortality, um, and we looked at the vegetation protection areas. So all of the natural areas like the state parks and the county parks, um, areas where we've done um, invested in restoration activities. Um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has a conservation opportunity area on the entire Little North Fork. So how can we protect those areas? What invasives are a threat? Um, and figure out what activities we can do to help mitigate those invasive impacts is kind of what went into this report piece for the invasives. And we've also created a website for a wildlife, wildfire recovery and response about using native plants for restoration after wildfire. So that's live on our webpage right now, um, just basically talking about why use native plants. Um, and it gives plant recommendations for upland and streamside habitats, and then gives planting tips. We have a native plant nursery list on there so people can find native plants and then also provide some propagation information from like live stakes. If, if people had stuff surviving, um, they can use what's already on site. Um, and just to kind of wrap it up, I just have a little bit of a slideshow here um, to just kind of show some of the things that I've been seeing out there as I've been out visiting um, and kind of go from one month to six months to about a year um, after the fire. You know, when you first went out there, you know, everything was gray, brown, black, there was hardly any color out there. Um, but even, you know, a month after the fire, you can start seeing things um, beginning to recover. Um, there are signs of native plants coming back. Um, and it's been really encouraging kind of over the past year and just seeing how resilient um, the native plants are in um, coming back out there. So this was just, these pictures were all taken just a month after the fire and there was stuff re-sprouting um, and coming up already. And then um, in spring, about six months after the fire, I went up the little North Fork. Um, I don't know if anybody had an opportunity to, to be up there this spring, um, but the Delphinium, the Larkspur was amazing. Um, just on little North Fork Road, down pretty low even with the confluence. Um, there was just delphinium everywhere. It was, it was beautiful. Um, and then I went to another property that had 
bleeding heart all, all over it. There were no trees left on this property and these little tiny bleeding heart plants, you could tell they were struggling a bit, but I, I hope that they kind of can hang on without a lot of shade. Um, but it was nice to see. And then we have some ocean spray um, re-sprouting and coming back. And then this, uh, this bracken fern was a really neat picture because it's a completely burned um, Western red cedar stump right behind it. So it's kind of that black, that bright green on that black um, is, was a, the picture doesn't do it justice for from real life. Um, and then here's just a few more, Salal coming back, mock orange, um, vine maple kind of again at the base of a, a burned stump there. Uh, this thimbleberry down in this lower corner here was at um, Pack Saddle Park. And it was probably about six feet tall um, in September when we were there. So really vigorously coming back. And the fireweed was also pretty amazing um, this summer and fall out there. And Pacific dogwood, um, it took me a while to figure out what this was. Um, I saw these sprouts and I was stumped. I was like, what is that plant? Um, and then saw the tree behind it, but um, yeah, so dogwoods coming back in a bunch of places, evergreen huckleberry, of course, poison oak, right? Um, and then conifer seedlings are coming back too. I saw the first conifer seedlings this fall. So that was really um, exciting. And I have two conifer seedlings in here because I was so excited about it. Um, and with the snowberry and the, the Oregon white oak um, re-sprouting from, from that burned tree there. So, um, Exciting stuff coming back, lots of natives. Um, the invasives aren't too bad out there um, yet. Uh, a lot of kind of annual weedy things, which I, which I call obnoxious plants um, coming in, but those are easier, a little bit easier to deal with than some of the false bromes and other invasives, but the natives are looking, they're looking good. I'm encouraged and excited. Um, and that kind of wraps it up. I did put a resource page in here, but again, I'll um, send John uh, a whole resource page that he'll send out to everybody who participated today. So you'll have these um, links and information. And that's it. Thank you, Jenny. Wonderful presentation. So uh, we have one question. And again, um, if you have any questions, you know, put them into the chat room. And if you get too shy, I'm just going to have people sort of raise their hands. So we have, for, I've got a couple, but I'm going to start with Linda Bowers is what is the best time of the year for a site visit? And I assume this is a site visit by you or someone from the SWCD. Yeah, we can come out any time of year. Um, it depends if you want, you know, um, help with identifying plants. Usually spring is, is the best. It's the easiest when things are blooming and most things are up, um, you know, fall and summer get a little tougher because they're crusty. Some of the plants are crusty and not there anymore. And winter things don't have leaves on them. So it's a little bit harder, but it's also a fun challenge, but yeah, spring, if, if you want plant identification, but any other time, if you have other resource concerns, we can talk about anything on your property at any time. Okay, so here's a question from Michael Hubbard. Where can we get seeds for native lupin to help with the blue butterfly? Oh, that's a good question. So I you're probably this referring- is, I this is the Fendlers. Yeah, the Fenders blue butterfly. Um, so the plant is also an endangered species. So it's a little bit more difficult to get those plants. Um, I know there wasn't, gentleman growing them. Um, and I don't know if he still is, but Michael, I can follow up with you um, offline and um, and see if I can dig up that information. But that's a good question. It's not readily available is the short answer. <laughs> uh, so from Kate, do you have a recommended app or other resources for identifying native plants? Yeah. Um, iNaturalist is a great app for identification. Um, I know there's others, but um, iNaturalist, you can take a picture and it'll give you um, recommendations. And then it's sort of a crowdsource too. So experts can kind of weigh in and 
you know, verify um, if you've identified it correctly, if or if you've chosen kind of the right one. It's it's kind of a fun app to use. So what is the name of the uh, native plant wholesale nursery? Would you be, would be nice to know so one could know it. Yeah, so what is the name of the native plant wholesale nursery that you mentioned? Yeah, um, it's Shampooey Nursery. They're up in um, Aurora area, or not Aurora. Um, yeah, Aurora, St. Paul. Uh, is there a website that lists native plant sales in Marion and or Polk County in addition to your native plant sale? Yeah, on that wildfire recovery page, we do have a list of some of the local native plant sales. Um, Benton Soil and Water has one, Yam Hill Soil and Water has one, Polk has one, we have one. Um, and there's some other um, things going around the Portland area too. Those aren't all, um, the Portland area ones aren't necessarily on that list though. So that's kind of why I threw during that. Mother, another one that was pretty good, I like their stuff, is during Mother's Day weekend, I don't know if they're going to do it this year, is Silver Falls State Park also has a native plant sale. So. Yeah, and um, uh, Deepwood Estate used to have a native plant sale. I don't know if they're doing theirs. They usually do that towards the end of March, I think. So uh, I've heard that native tree seedlings are sold out for replanting. Have you any recommendations for sources? Yeah, that's tough. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what availability looks like right now. Um, you'd have to kind of go around to some of those sources and, and start looking. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be tough to find, especially conifer seedlings. Um, if you wanted you know, shrubs or hardwood trees or something like that, you might be able to find a few of them, but probably not on a massive scale. But like I said, I haven't, I haven't looked recently, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Rochelle notes that Secret Garden Growers also carries mostly native plants and their otter can be. Oh, thanks, Rochelle. So what are, uh, this is from Catherine, what are a few of the best native plants for stabilizing stream banks in the Sandy Am Canyon and other stream site areas in the Willamette Valley? Nice, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have that um, on that wildfire recovery page. I do break down um, plant recommendations for upland and riparian areas. Um, for riparian areas, um, I usually recommend shrubs. Um, they grow quicker, they grow faster, they come to maturity faster um, than trees. Um, they do have deeper roots um, systems and some of them spread out. Um, so things in riparian areas that um, I like to talk about are Douglas spirea, yeah. red over dogwood, um, Pacific nine bark. Um, those are kind of some of the main, main ones. Um, just to name a few without kind of rattling off a huge, a huge list. So Michael uh, Hubbard asks again, are some, I assume this is nursery, starting to change some plant selections in anticipation of continued brutal summers? Yeah, I didn't, I kind of purposely didn't get into climate change or anything like that because it's a whole sort of another, <laughs> it's a whole other topic. Um, you know, there are some local species that are going to survive better than others. We don't quite know which ones those are quite yet, um, but essentially, you know, things that can handle those hotter and drier conditions um, are going to be the ones that do better. Um, then you kind of get into the whole, you know, if they start shifting what they're growing, we kind of get into the whole assisted migration thing, which... People have issues with that too, potentially, you know, with humans helping with that versus it coming here naturally on its own. Um, so it's it's kind of a big can of worms right now <laughs> to yeah, kind of get I into that. A, if I may make a pitch here, Dr. Tom Kay was our speaker last month and this was his topic. Uh, we recorded his session and I can get you access to his recording and it goes into great depth in a lot of these issues that uh, Jenny was talking about. Yeah, that would be awesome. I'd actually like to see that too. Yeah. <laughs> Share that with me. <laughs> uh, let's see. We have a long one from Aiden. And what is the role of mushrooms in the recovery of burned areas? Are there invasive mushrooms possibly associated with invasive plants? Conversely, let's see, where am I now? Do you know of any invasive plant mitigation strategies that use fungi? 
Those are all great questions, and I do not have any answers to those. I, I don't know anything about um, mushrooms and and fungus for recovery or anything like that. Sorry. Good. We have a topic for a, we're going to go find a mycologist. Uh, there you uh, go. Follow, follow <laughs> question. The burn areas that you describe are obviously different than the Willamette Valley, but in, I'm wondering what fire's role could be in controlling invasive plants and forests. Yeah, it all kind of depends on, you know, what invasive species you're working with. Some of them are more fire tolerant and fire dependent, so it can actually spread them like false brome. Um, there's been a lot of studies on false brome and it actually increases significantly um, with fire. So I'm really worried about that species in the, in the fire area in the canyon. Um, and some other species, you know, like blackberries, if it burned really hot, if it burned hot enough to kind of kill those roots, um, it could have a negative impact on um, blackberries. But I don't know that much. I'm not a... Um, I'm not a forest person, so I don't really know how a lot of these species are gonna um, gonna recover or be impacted. I do know false brome, um, but that's about it so far. And thistles, the thistles that. came back really thick. Both thistle and Canada thistle, we're seeing a lot of out there. So I, I, I have another question, but uh, I'm gonna sort of jump in here. So on your early detection rapid response, is there any particular invasive weeds that you're particularly concerned about? I mean, like the false brome? Yeah, so we did have kind of a subset of species that we pulled out um, in that ETART report. And we were looking at false brome, uh, the knotweeds like Japanese knotweed, a giant knotweed, uh, the three knapweeds, meadow, spotted, and diffuse knapweed. There's quite a bit in meadow knapweed up there that we're seeing come back. There's a few isolated populations of spotted knapweed. Um, garlic mustard was on our list. We don't know of any garlic mustard in Marion County, but um, if it ever was going to have an easy way of getting here, this is it. Um, with all the trucks and contractors and things and all the disturbance out there, Um what else was on our list? Yellow Archangel was on our list. That's a forest invader. And I think those were the main ones. I feel like I'm missing one. Um, but that kind of covers, those were sort of the main species that we pulled out. Oh, Italian thistle was another one because we had a couple locations of that when we did surveys several years ago. Um, so I wanted to put that on the list just because it was rare up there and we didn't want it to be spreading any further. So a question from Linda Bowers, where are you located? We, our office moved uh, this summer from Salem to Staten. We are now right in downtown Staten, um, but most of the staff is still working remotely. So I am located on my cell phone and on my email. <laughs> That's how you locate it. What is a good way to get rid of the archangel? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, small populations, um, you can pull it. Um, I always recommend pulling or kind of manual or mechanical control first. Um, mulching works too. After you pull it, put down some mulch to kind of tamp it out. Um, and then if you have larger populations, um, there are some herbicides that can work on that too. So is there any milkweed native to the San Am Canyon or do you recommend any to enhance monarch habitat? I would have to look at like the organ flora to see a distribution map of okay. the, you know, the showy milkweed. I'm not sure how far outside of the valley um, the native milkweed distribution goes. Yeah, I, I know um, that's a good question. I know they're planting speciosa uh, in the valley i mean for habitat i don't know if it's native that's actually an interesting question so right uh, i have a question on three probably more urban invasive weeds uh, mm -hmm. what, what, are, what control do you recommend for shining geranium lesser celandine and italian arum which are really just sort of exploding and within salem yes uh of course you had to ask that. Shine, I'll start with shiny geranium. That's the easiest one. Um, I mean, it's probably the most widespread, um, but it is an annual. So um, if you have small areas, um, pulling it or hoeing it, um, keeping it from going to seed um, and mulch it, throw leaves on it, throw bark on it, throw cardboard on it. 
um, and try to be careful walking through it so you don't spread it because that's how it's, I mean, it's spreading like crazy. Um, and it's, I think, because people are moving it around. Yeah. So um, cover it up is kind of by solution if you have an urban area, you know, and have something that's manageable. If you're in, in the forest, there's a, I've seen a lot of shiny geranium already coming up, you know, within weeks after the fire, shiny geranium was germinating already in the fire area. So I don't know what that's going to do. I think it's going to be kind of localized, but um, yeah, shiny geranium, cover it up mulch it. Um, lesser celandine, that is, that's a tough one. If you have small populations, you can dig it, but get all the soil and all the roots and put it in the garbage. Um, you know, get a backhoe if you need to, I don't know, like it's, it's really difficult. Um, you can use herbicides on it to kind of when it's flowering. Um, but it's pretty tough to kill. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about Italian and Aram? Italian Aram, I, you know, they have done studies on herbicides for Italian Aram and they haven't really found anything that's like 100% effective. Um, so it's difficult to um, prevent it from spreading. You know, don't disturb it. Uh, don't let it go to seed. Um, I think they found that ants were spreading the seeds. Mm -hmm. Oh. and carrying seeds. So um, definitely don't let it go to seed. You can carefully try to excavate around it. Um, but again, you know, dispose of everything around it in the trash. Um, so yeah. uh, two, two more <laughs> questions. What is the title of a good Oregon floor? And we have some responses, including Hitchcock and Oregon floor project. What was the question? Uh, what's a good flora uh, book for Oregon? Yeah, they're coming out with all the new volumes of the Oregon flora. So I am a champion of those. And I love the Oregon flora webpage. They just redid that Oregon flora webpage. And I use that all the time. I love the maps. Um, I love the photos um, and the distribution on that. And they have information. Um, another good online resource is the um, the Washington University of Washington, the Burke Museum Herbarium has a good online reference too. But the Oregon Flora books, I like those too. Um, yeah, Catherine's got the got the um, site there for Oregon Flora. Uh, one other, this is between, and I'll probably do this offline. We also offer a scholarship program. And it sounds like ours is very similar to yours. So I just want to offline of some way of promoting both simultaneously, because I don't know how you promote your scholarship. Um, but we have a scholarship as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, we can talk about it. Ours all go through, goes through the state agency, the Oregon Student Assistance Commission. So that's how we do it goes through them. And so it gets promoted on their huge lists. Okay, great. 